Hi, I'm Rafi Mirzayan from Los Angeles, California, and I'll be talking to you today about osteochondritis desiccans of the capitellum. OCD of the capitellum is a rare disorder of the elbow and usually affects adolescents between the ages of 12 and 16, and it's commonly seen in baseball players and gymnasts. Various etiologies have been proposed, including genetic, a vascular watershed area that undergoes repetitive trauma, especially in a throwing or axial loading motion. It is important to differentiate OCD from Panner's disease, which is more commonly seen in younger patients and is self-limiting and does not require surgical intervention. On a, a presentation, the patient has a gradual onset of lateral-sided elbow pain. There's loss of motion, uh, especially in extension. There could be locking or catching if there's a loose body, uh, and there's decrease in their performance over time. On examination, I do want to check the range of motion to check the, to see if they have a flexion contracture uh, and also tenderness to palpation over the capitellum through the soft spot with the elbow flexed. Radiographs are an important part in not only diagnosing but also to classify them. Takahara has taught us about the 45 degree flexion AP view which puts the lesion more in line with the beam of the x-ray and increases the sensitivity of plain radiographs. CTs have been proposed to be used. It is more accurate in localizing the lesions, and in one study, it was more sensitive than X-ray and MRI. The MRI is the gold standard at this point. It helps us see the size and the location of the lesion, as well as presence of joint effusions. If there are bone marrow changes, loss of cartilage surface continuity, uh, if there's a signal between the lesion and the bone, and if there's cartilaginous loose bodies, the MRI will detect that. And sensitivities as high as 100% have been reported. It is important to talk about classification systems to, that, will, that guide us in the treatment of OCD lesions. The Minami uh, radiographic classification is the most commonly used one. A grade one a lesion is a lucent uh, cystic shadow in the capitellum. A grade two is a, there's a split line which separates the lesion from the subchondral bone. And a grade three is when the fragment is detached and has become a loose body. The Itsubo MRI classification is the most commonly used MRI classification system. In a stage one, there's a normally shaped capitellum. There are several spotted areas with high signal intensity, but it is lower than the cartilage signal. A stage two, there's several spotted areas with higher intensity than that of cartilage. Stage three, there's discontinuity of the chondral surface, but there's no signal in the interface between the lesion and the subchondral bone. Stage four, there is separation and there is a high intensity line between the subchondral bone and the lesion. And in stage five, the lesion is displaced or has become a loose body. The ICRS classification is also used. This is uh, done arthroscopically. A stage one or grade one uh, OCD in the ICRS system, there's softening of the cartilage. In grade two, there's partial discontinuity. In grade three, there's complete discontinuity. And in grade four, there's a loose body present. Takar first recommended uh, treatment based on the stability of lesion. He classified a, a stable lesion in a patient who had an open capitellar growth plate with only a grade one radiographic change with a normal range of motion and a grade one ICRS. An unstable lesion was in patients who had a closed capitellar growth plate with grade two to three radiographic changes and higher ICRS grades and restriction in range of motion. Colmodin uh, also emphasized the lesion location to be significant in not only the prognosis, but also on the outcome of OCD lesions. And he used the radial center line to divide the location of the lesion to be medial or lateral to the radial center line. So a grade one would be the cystic change, grade two would be if the lesion is medial to the radial center line, a grade 3A is if the lesion has uh, passed to the lateral side, but the lateral column is intact. And a grade 3B is when the lateral column has been violated and there's no containment of the lesion. This is also important, and uh, Atira Mahata has shown that in a biomechanical study that the contact pressure in the radiocapitillar joint is greater with a lateral defect than with a central defect. So he uh, had an update to the Takahara classification and also guided with treatment. A type one would be with open physis, radiographic grade one, uh, normal range of motion. Those are gonna do well with rest and without surgical intervention. A type two, uh, the growth plate is closed. They have higher grades on the Minami classification on the radiographs. There's restriction of range of motion, but the lesion is medial to the radial center line. Those can be treated with debridement or, or even microfracture. 
uh, type 3A. Growth plate is closed, uh, higher grades on the ICRS as well as the radiographic stages, but the location is uh, lateral to the radial center line, but still contained. Those can be either repaired or reconstructed. And 3Bs, when there's loss of that lateral column and, and no containment of the lesion, those are going to do better with a reconstructive procedure. So let's talk about non-operative treatment. Um, these can be very successful in early stages with stable lesions. These are patients who have an open capitellar growth plate and resting them even up to six months usually takes care of the problem. Uh, of course, you have to shut them down from throwing and any axial loading onto the elbow to help with the healing of the lesion. And if they're pain-free, uh, they can start a throwing program at about five to six months after the initial diagnosis. Non-operative treatment in unstable lesions has been shown to do very poorly. We have low healing rates in, in these patients and also very low return to sport rate uh, when treating unstable lesions non-operatively. There are various surgical treatment options available in the treatment of osteochondritis desigans, including uh, as little as arthroscopic debridement with lavage and loose body removal, fragment fixation, bone peg grafting, microfracture, autologous achondral transfer, and fresh osteochondral allograft transplantation. In one study of uh, 38 patients who underwent just a arthroscopic debridement and lavage and loose body removal, uh, all 38 were able to return to play, however, in this midterm follow-up, 43% uh, of them had progression to osteoarthritis. So debridement and loose body removal may work well for very small lesions if they're less than 50% of the capitellar width. If they're medial lesions or if the patients are low demand, this may be an option, but not for bigger and more unstable lesions. Fragment fixation with the screw has been described in this one study, seven of seven patients were able to return to play. Um, this works well if there's a big enough bone fragment behind the cartilage surface uh, of the lesion, uh, if the lesion is a, a ICRS grade two or three, so there's some continuity and it's not become a loose body, but you have to keep in mind that a screw removal uh, may be necessary in these patients. Fragment fixation with absorbable pins has also been described uh, in this one study, 77% healed and 67 were able to return to play. However, there's concern of broken pins and loose body formation from those. Bone peg grafting has also been described with successful outcomes. Uh, these are in lower grade lesions, ICRS2, where there's partial discontinuity. Uh, you have to use two or three uh, pegs which are harvested from the proximal olecranon. Um, these do heal, but it can take a very long time for healing to occur. Uh, microfracture has been described. Uh, the advantages of that are that uh, it's easy to perform. However, we've learned from the knee literature that this produces a fibrocartilaginous surface that it's not durable and it's not uh, lasting. And as we can see from these studies here, the return to play rate is not very good. Again, uh, these might work for small lesions without significant bone loss, uh, or, or if they're medial lesions or if they're low demand patients. However, most people have gone away from uh, treating unstable OCD lesions with microfracture. By far the biggest uh, advancement in the last decade in the treatment of OCD lesions has been uh, the restoration of the articular surface with an osteochondral graft. It was done uh, originally with uh, autograft from the knee or from the rib. Uh, however, my concern with that is the donor side morbidity. Uh, in one study uh, that was a, a systematic review and meta-analysis, up to 8% of patients had donor side morbidity uh, following the harvest. So in this systematic and meta-analysis done, comparing all kinds of treatment options of OCD, by far the osteochondral allograft uh, transfer had the highest return to sport rate compared to fixation and microfracture. Because I was concerned about donor side morbidity, I began using fresh osteochondral allografts to restore the hyaline articular cartilage, and I avoided the donor side morbidity. And in my series, which I'll explain in a minute, I had 100% back to a return to play. Uh, the biggest disadvantage was cost at the time I started doing this. In 2006, uh, only hemicondyles were available, but since then, fresh pre-cut osteochondral allograft cores uh, are available and they're significantly less in cost. Um, so to me, this is a win-win. Uh, the surgical technique, I used a Takahara Ankenia splitting approach. It gives you a great exposure to the capitellum. I always begin my uh, procedures with an arthroscopic examination. I perform this in a prone position. It's very easy to convert to an open lateral or posterior approach. Uh, it allows me to do loose body removal and synovectomy. I'd like to go present my results of my series of patients that I treated with a fresh osteochondral allograft. These were nine male baseball players 
Between uh, 2006 and 2013, an average age was 15 years old. There were six pitchers and three position players, and the average follow-up was 48 months. There was significant improvement in the Mayo score, Oxford score, KDROC score, and DASH score, and significant reduction in the pain score. All patients were able to return to play baseball, and they played for at least two years, and one player had a college scholarship as a pitcher at the time of review. This is a case example of one of the patients at 15 months follow-up. You can see the graft has been completely integrated. There's no bone marrow changes or, or edema. And what's interesting is that because I harvested the graft from the knee, the, the cartilage is thicker, and you can see that there's a thicker cartilage cap over where the graft was compared to the native surrounding cartilage. So in conclusion, surgery is based on the capitellar physis status, stage, and stability. It's best to restore highland articular surface in larger lesions. Autograft is cost-effective, but I'm concerned about donor side morbidity. And I think fresh osteochondral allograft transplantation offers an excellent option for treatment of OCD lesions. If autograft is not available, or if the patient chooses not to have autologous harvest due to donor side morbidity. Thank you very much.